you're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. My name is uh, Christopher Black. I'm a criminal lawyer based formerly in Toronto in Canada. I was born in the UK, but spent most of my life in Canada. The last 30 years, I've been a criminal trial lawyer. And the last 20 years, I've been specializing in war crimes charges at the Hague Tribunal, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and the Rwanda Tribunal, and uh, various other cases related to those tribunals. Now, the first Uh, thing I've got to say is, why haven't people like Tony Blair and George Bush being through this process because we keep hearing about various kind of minor African leaders that have um, been put on trial at The Hague and found guilty, uh, including people from the former Yugoslavia. But the main war criminals, people like Tony Blair, George Bush, at least I suppose I should say alleged war criminals, uh, Zippy Livni over in Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, people like that, they don't seem to have uh, actually been called to account by the... Hague Tribunal. No. <clears throat> well, there's, there's, there's two Hague Tribunals. There was the, the ad hoc tribunals, which were the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal, and also the Sierra Leone Tribunal for Charles Taylor, which also... But they were all... Those set up under UN auspices were really controlled by the U.S. intelligence and NATO intelligence services in the U.S. And the Sierra Leone was basically U.S. Army operation. Um, So if you're working in The Hague, Christopher, uh, I'm interested in why it is that people like Blair and Bush haven't been tried there. People like Zippy Livni, you know, responsible for massacres in the Middle East with the illegal invasion of Iraq. Well, it's a very good question, but it means going into the fact that there are three different, well, there's two sets of tribunals. There are the ad hoc UN tribunals like the Yugoslav Rwanda tribunals in Sierra Leone, which were under UN auspices, but really controlled by the Americans and other Western intelligence agencies. And then there's the International Criminal Court, which only has jurisdiction back to 2003. And it only has jurisdiction for those countries which are members of the Rome Treaty. The United States signed on, but then withdrew. Russia and China are not members of the treaty. Syria is not. Afghanistan is not. Um... Although Afghanistan is now given permission to the ICC to do investigations. But 2003 so, was the year of the illegal Iraq invasion. Surely that's uh, right. within the jurisdiction. Why haven't we seen Bush and Blair hauled before the courts? Well, you can you can ask uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, prosecutors for the ICC that question, which we've asked, and they won't give you an answer. And it's quite clear that although the United States is not a member of the Rome Treaty and is not a member of that court, Uh, It controls, the EU and the United States control the staffing of that court, and they control key members of the staff in that court, and they they really approve the judges, and the prosecutor is appointed by the Americans, no matter that they're not involved in it, technically speaking. Uh, The present prosecutor, Fatima Bensouda, was a former prosecutor at the Rwanda Tribunal, and spent her career covering up U.S. war crimes in Africa. So they control the mechanisms of these tribunals, so there's no way that they can be they can be charged, even if you could assume some sort of jurisdiction. Well, this is worrying, isn't it? I mean, I was in Holland recently and speaking to just an average guy who was running a, a, a fish shop in the Hook of Holland, and he was saying how my father, who's still alive, his father lived through the war, and he said the thing my father always says is that the people in charge in The Hague now were on the wrong side during World War Two, And although right. his father didn't fight, you know, that's one of the things he's absolutely adamant about, that uh, the collaborators with the Nazis actually managed to get their fingers into the government pretty much straight after the Second World War. But anyhow, right. you've been involved, I know, at The Hague. Uh, you haven't given up, like many of us might, but you've been involved in both the Rwanda and the Yugoslavia cases. Can you right. just take us through those? Well, I got involved first at the Rwanda Tribunal. I was... Uh, My involvement came this way, briefly. When um, NATO attacked Yugoslavia, I was very angry about that in Toronto. We had big protests here against that, uh, massive protests. So I looked around for some other lawyers. What can we do as lawyers to try and do something against NATO? And there was a group here led by Michael Mandel, a professor at 
a law school here, who wrote the famous book, How America Gets Away with Murder. Uh, he led our team, and we filed war crimes charges against NATO at the Yugoslav Tribunal in The Hague, because at that time, the prosecutor was Louise Arbor, who was one time my professor of criminal law and was a colleague of these other guys. Anyway, she turned us down, froze us out, and acted really as a policewoman for NATO and charged Milosevic just at the time when the French and the Germans wanted to stop the attack and conclude some sort of peace deal. So she arranged with Madeleine Albright and Bill Clinton an indictment against Milosevic. So he became a quote-unquote war criminal and therefore could not be negotiated with, and the war continued. So that allowed the war to continue and justified the war in their propaganda. All the charges against Milosevic were absolutely false. And it turned out he proved that during the trial. I got involved in 2000. I was asked by the American Association of Jurists to go to Belgrade to do an investigation onto his arrest, whether it was a political arrest or not. And I found out that it was, in my opinion. They let me speak to the new pro-NATO, um, pro-fascist government they had installed there after the war. And their minister of justice told me to my face that the charges against Milosevic were false, but they had to arrest him because the Americans demanded it. And if they did not, they were going to be bombed again. And then he was shanghaied and taken to The Hague in, in, in an RAF plane and framed up with false charges. And he spent the rest of his life defending himself against those charges till he died in his prison cell under mysterious circumstances. At the same time, I got asked to defend a Rwandan general who was the head of the national police in Rwanda. And if you accept the standard narrative in the media about Rwanda, you compare the government there to the Nazis, he would be a Himmler, the head of the Gestapo. But he was acquitted of about 60 counts of genocide. And if you ask yourself, how can a man be acquitted of 60 counts of genocide who ran a national police force? Well, then you have to ask, did, was any of that narrative true? Because it wasn't. In fact, it was another, same as Yugoslavia, the Americans backed a proxy force like they're doing in Syria to attack a semi-socialist government, overthrow it, blame the government for war crimes, justify the installation of their puppet regime and keep it there since. And it's still under a dictatorship of Paul Kagame, who's murdered millions in the Congo since. That's how the system works. And I was lucky enough, or maybe unlucky enough, I'm, depending how you look at it, to get involved in those cases. And it's taken up the last 15 years of my life. And uh, what I've learned about what goes on in the international criminal justice system is enough to disgust even the most optimistic person, because uh, the people that say they're, they're trying to control war crimes and, and stop war, in fact, the ones who are committing them, they're the ones who commit the war crimes, they're the ones who find scapegoats, and they're the ones who spend their lives covering up their crimes and blaming others for them. Well, what do you make of the media coverage? Surely some of the things would have come out, like, for example, the mysterious death of Milosevic in custody. Well, it, you know, most people look at that and think, well, surely he was poisoned in his jail cell. Right. Well, we think he, I think he was personally. Uh, we don't have definite concrete proof of that. But there is a report. The only report done on his death was done by the NATO tribunal itself, the ICTY. It's called the Parker Report because there's a judge involved named Parker. And even in that report, which is very pro-NATO and tries to wash their hands of any responsibility, they indicate that there were two drugs in his body which should not have been there and can't be explained. It may have had an, a role in his death. One was a, a narcotic and one was a, a drug which expedites the deterioration of other drugs in the body, they accelerate the breakdown of chemicals in the body. So, and he wrote a letter three days before he, was, he died to the Russian embassy saying he was being poisoned. But he died before the letter could be acted upon. So I'm convinced he was poisoned. And the reason why is because he had won the case. There was no, he demolished the false charges against him. Uh, so they had one of three choices, let him uh, acquit him and let him go back into politics, which would be a major blow to NATO and would totally prove to the world there was no justification for their war against Yugoslavia. And he would be a major force again, or falsely convict him, which would raise lots of questions because there's no evidence to convict him, or they kill him. They eliminate him, and that's what happened. They couldn't let him go, and they couldn't convict him, so he died. So could you just go through briefly what the sort of charges were against him and how they fell apart? 
Well, they first arrested him in, Bel in Belgrade on corruption charges, claiming he'd stashed away billions. I was told by the deputy, the investigating judge on that case that it was all false. He had nothing. He had no money. At The Hague, they charged him that the indictment changed over time. It was initially for some alleged massacres in Kosovo that his forces were alleged to have been involved in. That fell apart. And then they charged him with vague conspiracy charges of conspiring to to create a greater Serbia, as if that's a war crime. It may be a political, I don't know, uh, issue, but they alleged that's a war crime. In fact, it wasn't true in any event. But he demolished all these charges, and he had lots of support from very high, high people testifying on his behalf. Uh, and all the charges, like Jeffrey Nice, the British prosecutor, um, was lying pretty much every day in, in the court there. He said the Kosovo field speech in which he alleged Milosevic said he was um, was pro-Serbian nationalist speech was actually a very a speech in in favor of eclecticism and and um, uh, ethnic diversity. It's the exact opposite of what Jeffrey Nice said it was when you listen to it. So the whole case fell apart. There was nothing against it. It was just they were just fake charges to justify the bombing. And the same with the Rwanda tribunal, by the way. That's not the story. Yeah, well, no, if you could go into that a little bit too, that would be fascinating. Thanks. Well, in a nutshell, Rwanda, Bill Clinton said Rwanda in 1989 was the Switzerland of Africa. It was a very small country, dirt poor, no resources, just a small middle of Africa country um, living on agriculture. Well, hang on, because Basically. Switzerland is not poor. It's extremely no, wealthy. It's Yes, well, they called it the Switzerland of Africa because despite its poverty, it had one of the best road systems, um, health systems, electrical systems, communication systems, school systems in Africa. Okay, so a bit, like, a bit like Libya maybe because that was actually really high-quality country too. Right, a bit like that, and it had help from Libya, North Korea, but also from West Germany, places like that. It, it was eclectic. It got support from socialist and non-socialist countries. So a lot of people studied in the USSR. Uh, but that was in 1990, the former aristocrats who had fled Rwanda during the revolution in 1959 wanted to take back power. The Americans asked the government of Rwanda to help them overthrow Mobutu in Congo, which they refused. So they went looking for somebody who would help them. And that was the aristocrats who wanted to take back power in Rwanda. And they got them to invade Rwanda and they were all members then of Museveni's army in Uganda. They invaded Rwanda in 1990. And like the Contras in Nicaragua, spent four years creating terror all through Rwanda, assassinating people, murdering, massacring people everywhere for four years. There were various peace deals over that time. In 1994, they launched their final offensive with the help of the UN peacekeeping force, shot down the president's plane, killed him, massacred most of the people, blamed it all on the government, and then had been took power and have been in power ever since. And then proceeded with Museveni in Uganda to invade the Congo, which was the original plan, to break up the Congo into pieces so it could be exploited for minerals. Did anyone I, really come to justice for all of this? No, not one member of the... I mean, they, as in the, the Yugoslav tribunal, they selectively prosecuted only the government side, which was defeated, and framed them up on all sorts of false charges. Uh, the people that did a lot of the killing, the, RP, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, and uh, allied with their American, Canadian, and Belgian um, allies, none of them were charged. In fact, a, a document was just released this week, uh, leaked, it's called as a top secret document dated 2003, in which the prosecution investigators list all the crime, or some of the crimes committed by the Rwanda Patriotic Front, massacres of and in a town called Masaka, 6,000 men, women, and children were executed in a couple of days there. And yet nothing's done about it. Whereas in Srebrenica, they called for Milosevic's head about Srebrenica, Milanic and Karadzic's head for Srebrenica, but 6,000 people in Masaka, nobody wants to know about it because it's an American, British, Canadian-supported regime that they put in power and did those crimes. Now, I know so you've, these... you've also had a look at, um, quite a close look, actually, the, the Maidan protests uh, back mm -hmm. in, tw oh gosh, was it 2014? 2014. 
Yeah. February 2014, I mean, the entire centre of Kiev in Ukraine, one of the biggest countries in Europe, um, is was uh, basically on fire. I mean, they were fires burning just to keep people warm, but also they were setting fire to things as well. Uh, there was a mass protest which was organised right from a right across the Ukraine. People came to protest against the government who they said was simply not bringing any taxes back to the regions that they were collecting lots and lots of money from everybody and then using it for their own purposes rather than actually uh, any kind of public spending on the regions. That, though, that was was a pretty horrific gunfight that ended that and there was effectively a kind of coup where the, uh, the new government of Poroshenko took over, literally over a weekend in February... 2014. Right. So you also been keeping quite a close eye, Chris, I know, on mm -hmm. the court cases that have followed that. We've heard virtually nothing about yeah. these in the Western press. Yeah, it's, it's what they did in, in, in um, Kiev was exactly what they did in Belgrade in 2000 when they overthrew Milosevic in a putsch organized by 5,000 mobsters and with NATO forces infiltrated into them who attacked the city attacked the Socialist Party headquarters and burned it, beat people up, and just seized power and got the support of NATO immediately. And that's exactly what happened in Maidan. There's now a case going on in, in Kiev in which three Kiev policemen were charged by the Kiev regime with being involved. Burkett police officers were involved with murdering people. Their defense lawyer has found several Georgians who were part of a 50-man mercenary sniper team brought in to Kiev and operating in teams of 10 people were stationed on various buildings in the Maidan Square area, the Ukrainska Hotel and some other buildings. <clears throat> they said, they testified that they're the ones that did all the shooting. They shot police officers, they shot civilians, they shot all sorts of people just to create chaos and blame it on the government. And it turns out that um, one of the, they did a, let me see here. Now, just hang on a second, Chris, because... Sure. This is pretty shocking, isn't it? The idea that the people who are protesting against the government would be shot dead and then that would be blamed on the government. Uh, but actually, the people who were doing the shooting were those yeah. who were trying to overthrow the government. It's a bit of a mind bender, isn't it? Well, that's how dirty these people are. That's what they, they've been doing through all these wars. Um, and the people don't understand how that. These people really are ruthless. They're willing to do almost anything, in fact, anything to get their way. And they don't care about ordinary people being killed. They don't care about ordinary citizens being killed. They couldn't care less. Um, but those people who more... they killed were also basically on the same side. Uh, if you want to you know, yeah. characterize it like that, they were, they were trying to uh, uh, overthrow the government uh, and they were shot for their pains. Exactly. So a lot of people were, were caught, pulled into that protest movement for all sorts of reasons, although it's not as much as people think. But enough were, were there, and they got, they got shot uh, for being there, and they were used, and they were, they were killed. Uh, it goes beyond that. They also say that um, an Italian journalist, Jen Michelesen, interviewed on Canale five Italian TV, three of these Georgians, and they said that on the 18th of February, they were taken to the Ukraine hotel, and they met there with a member of the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division, who they said gave them orders what to do and who to shoot. And they were, ran they were ordered to randomly target people, protesters and peace alike, to create fear and confusion, to implicate the government forces as the shooters, and to create the chaos necessary in order to undermine the government of Yanukovych. And the, they named the, the man, the American soldier was going under the alias, maybe his real name, maybe an alias, Brian Christopher Boyinger. And he was later shown up as an advisor to the Ukrainian Georgian Legion, which is a fascist and pro-Nazi uh, military formation. But they, so you have basically a NATO operation. This is very complicated to import 50 mercenaries, set them up in sniper teams commanded by an American soldier whose rank we don't know. That means that's a NATO operation. That was very well planned out. That was planned out in detail ahead of time. Would that have been planned at NATO headquarters in Brussels, somewhere like that? It would have to be planned somewhere high up because these people had to be brought in. They had to cross borders. They had to have papers. They I mean, had to have surely it could just be an operation by 
the Pentagon or, you know, by the US if it's an American soldier giving the orders? Uh, not at that level. When you're overthrowing governments, it, you can't do that on the fly with uh, amateurs. These people, <laughs> this, this is a this is a, a NATO operation. They were successful in in overthrowing Yanukovych, installing a puppet regime, their own their favorite regime. So it has to be a NATO operation. And the fact that we've now found out at least one American soldier was involved with these sniper teams, and the American ambassador must have known about it because the uh, Mr. Parabi who was a member of the Ukrainian pro-Nazi um, government after the coup, was at the Ukraine hotel, knew who was there, knew who the shooters were, and was in communication with the U.S. ambassador all the way through the, those days. So well, he, he, was also, he, he also took over, didn't he, as the head of the National Security Council? He did, and yet he's one of the guys that was involved in shooting these people. What about others? I mean, you, you're talking about, you know, quite a lot of sniper teams. You've mentioned Georgians. Were there any other nationalities brought in, do you know? Well, there may have been. We only have evidence right now of uh, these Americans and these Georgians. Um, Dr. The Canadian professor, Dr. Ivan Kachinovsky at the University of Ottawa, published an article in 2015 in which he said that our investigation concludes that the massacre was a false flag operation which was rationally planned and carried out with the goal of the overthrow of the government and seizure of power. Uh, it found various evidence of the involvement of an alliance of far-right organizations, right sectors of Aboda, oligarchic parties. Um, concealed shooters and spotters were located in at least 20 maidan controlled buildings or areas, and blah, 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 blah. And he goes on that... Um, we don't have concrete information about U.S. government involvement at that time, but we suspect it. So, yeah. I mean, this is enormously important, isn't it, as this country is right up against Russia. We're now seeing, uh, literally this week, the biggest uh, NATO exercises for a generation, really since 1990 and the end of the Soviet Union, uh, with NATO troops mobilising uh, around the Baltic area and north of Ukraine, and also with NATO troops in Ukraine doing uh, joint operations with them, almost as if they were already in NATO. Of course, Ukraine is not quite in NATO, and it would be worrying if it was because of the very strong neo-Nazi parties in Ukraine. Yeah. Well, to me, Ukraine really is de facto a part of NATO, whether it uh, adheres to the documents or not. Uh Probably, well, probably won't happen because of human rights concerns in, in certain quarters in NATO, but it's de facto a NATO satellite now. I mean, Canadian troops are there, British troops, French troops, American troops, and all sorts of so-called mercenaries uh, who may or may not be mercenaries may still be connected to their original formations and their regular armies of those countries. Okay, so NATO, uh, we can, we're hearing quite a lot about... The wicked deeds of NATO, I mean, I'm starting as a British journalist to start to think, well, maybe I'm in the evil empire since we're part of NATO nowadays. What, what's NATO's right. ultimate aim? And I wonder, is there any kind of possibility to check what they're up to by our MPs here in Westminster? Well, yeah, your MPs could ask uh, direct questions and demand direct answers, but they don't do it. Uh, the same in Canada. Canada is one of the most loyal of the NATO allies to the United States. So we're supplying forces to every war they've fought in. So what is their life. ultimate aim, Chris? Well, the ultimate aim is NATO is, to me, um, the, the armed wing of the capitalists of the United States and its allied states. It's really using the might, the military might of the United States and its allies supporting it to get the will of the corporations that want to exploit the resources and the people of this planet. And it's quite clear that they want world domination and hegemony. And they won't put up with anybody conf uh, resisting that. Like in any Soviet Union was overthrown and the, the Russians overthrew that and it's installed a, pop a capitalist regime there, uh, thought they had their day and were going to be welcome. But they got slapped in the face. Once they became, they started acting independent again after Yeltsin went out and Putin came in. Once the Russian nationalists came to power and began standing up to them for them, then suddenly everybody hates the Russians, according to NATO, and the same with China, because now the American, the Americans and their allies can't control the world as they wanted to, and so they're creating as much chaos as they can to try and to try and attain that aim. Now, I mean, we all, I think, want to see justice. 
uh, for the war criminals. Uh, you know, whether or not he actually gets convicted and jailed, uh, many people in Britain want to see Tony Blair uh, stand trial. Um, is there any f- uh, forum under which these kinds of cases might happen, some sort of alternative to The Hague, since it does seem that uh, The Hague is captured, really, by NATO? Yeah, there's no there's no official uh, state or international tribunal before which they could be brought. I, I don't see it happening. Uh, unless there's a world revolution somehow. <laughs> well, look, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of hinting there because I know there have been cases. Is it in Malaysia, I think? Well, you can have people's tribunals of various kinds set up. I took part in one in New York in 2000 and against NATO. Ramsey Clark led that one, and we indicted them and convicted them of crimes. And you can do the same in Britain. I mean, Bertrand Russell war crime, uh, the uh, Vietnam War and uh, peace movement and the nuclear arms peace movement. Uh, was very important in the 1960s and 1970s. I mean, that can be started again, but I'm not sure we have people of that stature who are willing to take part in these in these protest movements anymore. Um, it's almost impossible to get the war, the anti-war movement, peace movement going. And here in Canada, it seems to be taken over by the these humanitarian interventionists who think that peace comes through war. Every time some nation is accused of, or some government is accused of mistreating its people, they're ready to jump in and save them. <clears throat> that means beating up everybody else in the way. Uh, that seems to be very popular. I was just in talking about um, a peace movement here in Canada, and we got the objection of they don't want us to hear from um, Vanessa Beely because she puts out so-called pro-Assad propaganda. I mean, this is the problems we face here, and probably the same in Britain. There's not the same, I don't know what's happened the propaganda they control is more effective or people have been disillusioned or because the working class is more split up. I'm not sure exactly all the reasons why, but the peace movement is not like it was back in 2003 when in Toronto we had 300,000 people protesting the Iraq war. Where is that? And you had, I think, a million people in London, maybe more. Where are those movements now? Uh, Well, one possibility is that uh, the massive austerity has meant that there simply isn't the money to organise these sorts of things. Another one, of course, is that there's been infiltration. We just had uh, some news over here in the UK that the Socialist Workers' Party, who are a really quite well-organised left-wing group, uh, many of their meetings were mostly um, police infiltrators in the meetings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's been the way it has been. Well, they've been doing that to the left for well, hundred years or more, so we can't be surprised at that. But yeah, that, but that doesn't really account for. We had those infiltrations back in the sixties and seventies, and yet the mass peace movements, anti-war movements, then. So, what's your best um, guess as to why this uh, dilution of the anti-war movement then? Well, I think you're partly right about austerity is demoralised people. People are struggling to make a living and can't have other things to worry about going onto the street and getting involved in protests. Also, the fact that these very large protests we had against the Iraq War in 2003, I mean, they were massive, I think the biggest ever held, uh, didn't stop that war. And then we all could say we spoke out against it, but it didn't actually stop the war. And people, well, say, what's the point? We go out in the streets, they still do these wars. And so we can say we've done something. What have we done? Nothing, really. Well, I think it's something. I think we should express our disapproval of these wars, but the question, the good question is, it does, it, does it really effectively stop these wars? And that's a good question. Um, the Vietnam War protests, did they really stop the Vietnam War? Or was it the defeat by the United States militarily on the field? And why did those protests take place? Mainly because people didn't want to be drafted. If there had been no draft as a professional army, maybe you wouldn't have had the Vietnam War protests either. It's a study in psychology and sociology, what, what all the reasons may be, but um, I think we have to keep struggling to try and start to keep uh, the fire lit under the peace movement, the anti-war movement, because it's getting very dangerous. And with the uh, withdrawal of the Americans from all these uh, weapons treaties, it looks very, very dangerous. And as you say, the, the NATO exercises in the Baltic are a direct threat against a provocation against re- Russia. I mean, um, they've been threatening the St. Petersburg area and Kaliningrad now for about three years. But surely, I mean, nothing can happen there because it's got to be sabre-rattling because Putin is uh, a bit better defended than uh, people like uh, Gaddafi um, and Assad were. 
But actually, well, actually, he's a, he's yeah. aligned with Assad now. But I'm I'm thinking more about people like Saddam and Gaddafi. They they yeah. they were not well defended. Actually, it you know the idea of taking on Putin in a similar fashion is surely it, it's suicidal. Well, you would think so, but then. Uh, when I was in Moscow in 2011, when they were attacking Libya, and it was, it was very depressing. I was myself personally very, very depressed about that, and still am. But in Moscow, the mood was very dark. I, I met with some Putin advisors and people linked with the, the party, and I spoke with the Communist Party people as well. The mood was across the board dark and, and depressed. And I, a deputy foreign minister told me that they regard the American leadership as completely irrational and therefore capable of anything. And they said, you'll see us dodging and weaving and bending and you, when you think we should be stronger and more firm. But you have to remember, we went through a war in which tens and scores of millions of our people were killed. We're not going to get, we don't want to get into another one. We're going to try everything to avoid that kind of war. And you'll see us doing things which you don't approve of. But that's our one goal, to avoid nuclear war. But I agree with them. I don't think the American leadership is rational. I mean, you would think that somebody in the military must be. But the way they're acting is completely irrational, and they're building up their forces on the Russian western borders constantly. They're threatening them constantly, and the same with China, and the same with Iran. They're attacking them in Syria. They've actually attacked China. They bombed their embassy in the 1999 attack on Yugoslavia. They attacked China. They bombed the embassy. That's an attack on China. They don't care. I, don't, I think we're in a very dangerous situation where the American leadership and are are irrational then they're they're just consumed with their own um, omnipotence i mean could it be that they're actually working in the interests of uh, another state that they're not actually you know that america may, at some point might simply be jettisoned um for what is effectively the interests of other countries well i think the americans have their own in deep interests um you can say that israel has an influence on them which is true but uh, we have to remember that Israel is a very small country and wouldn't survive without for five minutes without the American support. I mean, the, the Israel is a, a very damaging influence in the Middle East. But how does it get its influence because of the weapons and the power given to it by the United States? I mean, it was defeated in the 73 war. Its entire air force was wiped out, but they were saved by the Americans flying over their planes and their pilots to, to, with Israeli markings to, to finish off the Egyptian army finally. But otherwise, they were dead. Um, so the Americans saved them there, and they saved them all the time. Um, but yes, they do have influence, and they have their own agendas, and they get the American, they pressure the Americans to follow those agendas when they can. But the American leadership have their own deep interests, and they will jettison anybody if it's in their interests. As we see, they've, I mean, they're doing a damaging their NATO ally Turkey. Um, they they slapped Europe in the face with all these tariffs. I mean, these are NATO allies, but they don't treat them like they're friends. What do you make of Brexit? Is it a storm in a teacup, or do you think this is quite significant, Chris? Well, I I myself, if I'd been if, if overseas British had been allowed to vote, I would have voted for Brexit myself. Um, why? Because I like many. I'm a Marxist, and like many of us, when the EU was first formed. We thought the Marxist idea of, of uh, the bigger the machinery, then when we take over, it'd be much easier to control the entire machinery of, the, of all of Europe. We could have a revolution in the entire Europe, European theater. But instead, what happened, the EU turned into really a, a neoliberal, semi-fascist organization, which is imposed on the working people across Europe, all sorts of austerity measures. It has just lowered the working standards, living standards of everybody in it, and was promising prosperity. So for my, myself, I thought if the British working class can escape that, they have a better chance of dealing with their local uh, ruling class uh, than they do trying to fight with the other Europeans, the entire dominant of German, French, British uh, capitalist class all lumped together. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. So I think it's a good thing. And I, I think when they called the referendum, they, they expected to, to, to not to win. I don't think they wanted them to, to vote for Brexit. And when it became, it looked like that's what's going to happen. They started panicking because they don't have a plan, obviously. <laughs> but they're forced to go through with it. So I, I, it shows their stupidity, really, and their misreading of the people. 
Chris, look, one of the big problems has been, uh, we've touched on it quite a few times, is the the press, the media. Um, is there any way, do you think, to, or even specific websites you'd recommend in order to try and get uh, another more accurate view, a more balanced view of what's going on in the world? Because the trouble is, so much of our uh, mass media is, a, you know, kind of corporate media, which is in bed with the uh, problematic governments who are squirrelling away their money in tax havens and see their readers as people to be told what to think and influenced rather than uh, people who are appreciating decent journalism. Yeah, well, there are many independent journals or blogs on, on as you know, on we can go to Counterpunch. We can go to Global Research in Canada, which is almost like a vacuum cleaner clean, um, information clearinghouse. And um, Greenville Post, Twenty uh, First Century Y. Just, just my one I write for New England, New Eastern Outlook um, does some good stuff. Some, and there are many thing, many small journals like that which people can access um, still on the net. Although the Washington Post is listed them all a couple of years ago and accused them all of being Russian agents and therefore was threatening to shut them all down. Um, so there are these journals, but I'm afraid to say that although when we read them and we talk to each other, we think everybody's reading them. The fact is, I live in a small town in Canada. Nobody reads them where I am. Uh, everybody reads the mass newspapers and the usual mass TV channels. They get their news from CNN, the CBC, the BBC. The Guardian and so on and so forth, and the Telegraph and the Daily Mail. That's where most people get their stuff, and they're too tired and too busy to look at anything else. I have the leisure every day of scanning all the major press from around the world, from Xinhua to the Cuban News to the New York Times to London Times to local news. I can and then I can sift through and try and find out what may be the truth among all that. And I can go to many many blogs and independent journals and read their articles about people who really know what's going on. But most people don't have that luxury or don't have the time. So it's it's out there, and the more we create, the better it is. And your program is an important aspect of that. So I'm very happy to be on your program to help people encourage to follow you, for one thing. But I don't know. I wish there was some way that the labor parties of the world or the, or the workers' parties of the world would form one major news organization like UPI or Reuters or something like that, but nobody's ever gotten together to do it, which is a big failing of the left movement, I think. Okay. Chris Black, thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome. Well, that's all for this week. Dialects Bristol's first weekly podcast. You can download it to listen on your phone or in the car. You can subscribe to our email list and listen the week before broadcast, if you like, online at dialectradio, one word, co uk. Thanks to our guests, Max Langer from Bristol University, talking about his Facebook page, the Bristol Bus Protest, and at Bristol's Buses, which is on Facebook and on Twitter. And you just heard then from Christopher Black, international criminal lawyer from Toronto in Canada, who writes for the New Eastern Outlook online journal and also globalresearch.ca. Thanks also to studio engineers, Joss Chivers and Dave Bazenko. Dialects of Bristol Broadband Co-op Production catch us on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon and anyone can contribute. Contact us at the People's Republic of Stokes Croft just off Jamaica Street. They're online at prsc.org.uk You can talk to PRSC Arts Centre if you like on 0117 909 6897 or volunteer with us or for hundreds of opportunities across Britain via the National Volunteering website. That's do-it.org. Thanks for listening to Dialect, and I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week. I'll be back on Friday with my two-hour BCFM politics show, live from 6 till 8pm. Meanwhile, till next Tuesday midday, from the Dialect crew, goodbye for now. Shakira, Shakira.